You know, we have talked about a lot of things in this show so far this past year. Now we've celebrated our one year anniversary. Mm -hmm. And one recurring theme seems to be the ascension process and near-death experiences, also healing modalities and things like that. Well, today on this show, we are actually combining a bunch of those together because our next guest is someone that kind of combines all of these in one all-encompassing conversation. And I have no idea where we're gonna go because we can go in so many different directions and that is what makes it so exciting. <laughs> My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something, anything, that will prove that there's something beyond this physical, three dimensional world we all live in. This is the, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Before we get started, I wanted to remind you that on our website, we do have a members only section exclusively reserved for listeners who join the community. The membership is always free and comes with a weekly newsletter that provides insight and reminders about our current and past episodes, along with suggested topics and shows that are companions to the topics we discuss on the show. Now, the best part about joining our community membership includes access to the members only section of the site that provides added benefits of discounts for products and or services from some of our past guests. So head on over to skepticmetaphysician.com and join our community right now so you don't miss out. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's get on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Skeptic Metaphysicians. We're excited that you're here. I'm Will, as always, joined by my beautiful co-host, Karen. Karen, thank you for coming on the show again. Well, thank you for letting me. <laughs> it, no, letting you, are you kidding? I, I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't keep you out even if I wanted to. You are just way too good for the show. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you left me hanging. I did. <laughs> well, Karen, she's a gifted clairvoyant. She's a spirit medium. She's also a quantum healer, and she has more than 22 years of experience. Wow. Yeah. No, this is that is nothing. Listen to this. She healed herself from an autoimmune illness. Oh, wow. And then promptly had a near-death experience while traveling in Egypt. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, well, wow. yeah, now now she helps people that are going through their ascension process and helps them to reach higher levels of awareness. So she has a lot to talk about. I could not be more thrilled to welcome a miracle to the show, Amira Hall. Amira, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you, Will. What a wonderful introduction. I'm excited to listen to what she has to say, too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we you never know with me what's going to come through. So let's brace ourselves. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to finding out what comes out because uh, very similarly, I don't ever know what's going to come out of my mouth. And I've seen Karen cringe lots of times while we're as things are coming out it's of my mouth. Definitely not miraculous. <laughs> I don't know. It's miraculous. We're actually still on the air, I would well, say. <laughs> Thank you again for coming on the show. I think we probably need to really hit that elephant in the room first and foremost. Everyone wants to know about how you healed yourself from an autoimmune illness. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I most definitely. I'm happy to. And I think it's really, really a poignant time in history right now, what we're all facing, right? Or the fear of facing some debilitating illness and, and, and fear of dying. So for me, you know, it was over 30 years ago now that the medical system pretty much shut the door on me. I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, but that was after my dad died and I was going through a divorce and that was all happening around it within six months of each other. And at that time, you know, they just lumped everything into chronic fatigue and I was exhausted. I exhausted my immune system. And so it, you know, for two weeks I cried, right? I was pretty Ooh. desperate. The doctors told me to go home and prepare my, my affairs. Ooh, wow. Well, I wasn't quite ready for that, I guess. And I'm a bit of a fighter, a little feistiness in me. I was new to the U S I'm from Canada and I had no support system, very few friends. So I felt like my whole life was falling apart. And I think, for most people that are, we talked about spiritual awakening or this ascension process. And I think for a lot of people, what happens is some major event or a significant loss or a, an extreme illness triggers us into that 
soul searching. For me at the time, you know, considering that was over 30 years ago, you know, there wasn't an internet system and there weren't very many books talking about that subject at the time. So it was kind of going back to the basics and figuring it out. I used acupuncture and chiropractic. I had to adjust my diet. I started to learn about detoxing my gut. So all of these topics are really, really, you know, very commonplace now. Back in the day, everybody thought I was nuts because I was on a 30-day detox. So I was a bit ahead of my time, I guess you could say, but I proved it to myself first that I could do it. And quite honestly, I don't know that that was a frame of mind I had. It was a pure survival at the time. And mm. um, while I was going through those, that process of detoxing and, and fasting and trying, you know, the colon cleansing and going to the beach and just quietening my mind. And I started yoga and meditation. So it was a compilation of a lot of different things that really, I think, is a, a powerful approach. It's not just one thing and staring at a crystal isn't going to help you process what you have to do. And I remember one doctor, actually it was my chiropractor that said that I had emotional overload and I needed to learn to quiet my mind. At the time I was working in corporate America, so I was busy and I was successful and I was in the top 10 for the country. And I was also studying for my master's and I got magna cum laude, you know? So I was a real type A personality and nothing was really gonna slow me down. I didn't know how to slow down. So that was the journey that began. And as I started to loosen and relax my mind and heal myself, give myself the space. And now the terminology I use for that is I, I, I was letting go of programming sense mm -hmm. of belief systems, fears, you know, the trauma, the fear of being alone in a foreign country, the fear of not being married and, and the fear of, you know, what, what are people thinking of me going through a divorce and now my dad left me and going through all my childhood and the processes of, you know, that traumatic lifestyle at the time. And so that's, that's it. That's spiritual awakening in a nutshell. You know, yeah. We, yeah. we have to let go of everything that we, we think we are. A word from friends of our show. Chaos is universal. We all have chaos. Whether it's big or small or somewhere in between, we might as well share it. The chaos of life. So we can feel heard, validated, maybe make someone laugh, or just know we're not alone in all the chaos. I'm Jocelyn, host of Keeping Up With Chaos podcast, where you'll find connections, conversations, and of course, shared chaos. We bring on all different kinds of interesting guests and friends of ours from all different places, living different lives, but sharing their stories here with you. Because why not? We all have a story to share and maybe a little bit of chaos too. So let's get that conversation started. Join Keeping Up With Chaos podcast every Wednesday at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Find us on most podcast apps like Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Keeping Up With Chaos podcast. We hope you join us. Cheers. And now back to the skeptic metaphysicians. Hey, well, in true form, the minute we have spirits or near-death experience people with us, the gremlins come out. And it, this is no different. Uh, we just started talking to you. We got a lot of great information from you. And boom, all of a sudden, everything fell to the wayside. So we're going to try this again. Mira, are you still with us? I'm with you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, we were talking about how you uh, helped heal yourself from an autoimmune illness. And I was about to ask you, we've had quantum healers on the show before, but you actually are one of the pioneers of that modality. So do you think, is that something that you were using to help yourself during that process? Not really. I needed to take care of my body at that time physically. In the 90s, there wasn't any conversation around that. We didn't have the internet at the time. Research on that subject, you know, chronic fatigue, I don't know. I think it was a new buzzword that doctor had in his bag, but it was almost a decade later after my near-death experience when I started to understand where I went when I left my body that I believed I stepped into the quantum field. And I never had words for it for a very, very long time. So my near-death experience happened in 1998. 
And it wasn't until at least 2000, maybe 2001, 2002, that I even started using that word or referencing it. And even then, the masses weren't talking about it. So what I understood about that energetic field that I called the quantum, I at first thought I called it the matrix, but the energetic version of stepping into everything that was interconnected and backwards and forwards and inter, you know, it was just, it, it was mind blowing. But I, I started to understand that literally everything that permeated everything that existed was a frequency and that in order to heal myself or in order to create and manifest, what I needed to do was align with that frequency. I'm really curious to talk to you about your near-death experience and how that really, I mean, I guess, really opened up your toolbox, right? It, it, it gave you access to such a bigger world than what you were working with before. So I guess let's take it a step at a time. Let's start there because that was the point when I came back to, I, my, my experience happened outside the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. And when I, I had to travel back to the U.S. that day. When I landed like 20 hours after my experience, everybody in the airport looked like a walking two-dimensional paper doll, black and white. And I couldn't look at anybody. I couldn't come. I mean, I knew I was walking. I was in this world, but it was so freaky because it was like anger and depression and fear. It was such a low vibration. And I was still vibing in a really, really high frequency that I would call love, bliss, you know, a total resonance to peace. And then I stepped into that zone. It was like hitting hitting an air pocket in the airplane, you know, it was just like, oh, this is gross. And so I, I had a book with me and I thought, I just got to stare at this book. I got to look at the book. This is real. I didn't really know what was happening. So I realized after a while, I was reading the book upside down. I wasn't really reading it. I was just trying to have something to focus on close to me that I could hold rather than staring out into the, you know, waiting area. Well, that, that perception stopped when I got back to San Diego. And what I, re what I did was I, I was very depressed. I was really angry and I was fearful and I didn't know what happened to me. I didn't dare, unlike you that went to see psychologists and all these people, I did explore, but I didn't dare go see a psychologist. I figured, you know what, I know I'm not crazy, but I'm not really sure, but, but they, they I, may think I am and put me away. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Lock me up and throw away the key. You know, right. Right. So right. I, I, I did not do that. I went to about a dozen different psychics and different healers because in San Diego, there were, you know, a dime a dozen. They all told me something different. So, you know what? That really pissed me off. I was, mad. I was really mad at God. I was really mad at those psychics. And I was real. And, you know, I sort of kicked the, you know, cat. I didn't have one at the time, but I just really was pissed off. And uh, that anger was just, you know, oozing out of me. Fired my friends, fired my family, fired my hobbies. Oh, yeah, I lost my job shortly after. And I, I realized I had to get the answers within me. And when I started to learn some tools and integrate some of the information I was getting, it had to do with my clairvoyance. Now, I didn't call it that. I didn't know that. But it was being able to tune in to what I could see. So I access it through my clairvoyance. And I believe our clairvoyance, again, it's my belief. Everybody's got their own journey and they, I'm not here to program anybody. But when we learn how to adjust our chakra system, turn down the dials, turn up the dials, and be able to sit in like what I call the center of a lighthouse. It's a power place. Because then we've got a 360 degree view. We can go up, we can go down. But it helps us to be, have a perspective of looking out and seeing what we need to see. It's a way to soften perhaps our trained mind of how we're trained to see things to then get the answers interdimensionally or 
from another realm. You know, if it's not interdimensional, I don't know what, but, you know, sometimes words limit the experience. Sure. And so I like to say, and I've been teaching people for 22 years, how to develop and open that pineal gland. And, and the whole purpose is to heal yourself, to look and see where there's energetic blocks, to find the answers and the information. Then when you can see, you can do something with it. If I don't know there's any fingerprints on the window and I'm having a real hard time seeing and, you know, trying to find a clarity, I'm never going to, until I clear it, I'm not going to have clarity. So I teach people how to literally remove what I would, you know, the metaphorical fingerprint. And that's archived in our energetic field that is interdimensional and, and a quantum level. And it could all, you know, go back to past lives. It could go to future lives. You know, the key for all of it in our spiritual awakening, our ascension, raising our vibration, is to increase our frequency and to be, to learn how to manage our energy field so that we can be present. Because, you know, that's where the law of attraction really kicks in. You know, I heard you talk about, you know, the importance of being able to feel something, feel what you want to create. But more than that, in my books, there's a knowingness. And it's alignment with the picture, the feeling, and a presence that it's already created. Therefore, I call it a knowing. You're being it as if it's already happened. And some people talk about being it or acting as if it already occurred. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's, there's a resonance in your body when that goes click. And then of course you're neutral and you're, there's the, the commentary about the being detached, but there's a lot of things that in, can interfere on in the energetic realm that screws up your manifestation. Now, I just would like to take a quick step back. So okay. you talk about being clairvoyant. Is that something that you had or you knew about before your near-death experience? Or was that triggered by the near-death experience? And what was that experience like? The trauma and the grief and anger and despair that I stepped into or the vibration that I was holding as I shifted out of the experience from Egypt coming into the U.S., is the part I believe that blocked all of my spiritual abilities. And I believe it's the thing that blocks everybody's spiritual abilities. I have the understanding now that we come pre-wired. We are like this massive, amazing, supernatural software system. And we're corrupted. We've got these viruses called life experiences. <laughs> we've, got, Look at we've got some mama malware going on. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Yeah. And so when you can see all that stuff, it's, it's relatively simple. Having the right tools, having the right perspective, and in a space of neutrality, because when we're not neutral, we can't be effective. Right. And that's the whole secret in quantum healing is having complete neutrality. And I guess that's what they call finding your center, but also the zero point, releasing, right? You need to find a point where you have released to the point where your ego is gone, your sense of self is gone in order to align yourself with who you are truly. Now, we've danced around it a lot. We talked about the near-death experience in Egypt, but can you tell us what happened? How did you die? I mean, or did, did you die? What caused it? Everybody wants to know the drama, not the, not the after effects. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to talk about the after effects for sure. That's the, our focus. Okay. But, yeah. but, but set the table for us. What happened? Okay. And then we'll move into the, the after effects. Yeah. So I was on a spiritual pilgrimage because as I started to heal myself, like many, many people right now, I knew there was something more. Mm -hmm. And I had this really successful job. I was having more money than I knew what to do with, but there was something more. And so there I was, I found this group that was going and went on this amazing spiritual pilgrimage where I started to see things, granite statues smiling at me and listening or hearing that celestial angels singing and amazing things in the pyramid, in the uh, temples and the pyramids. I stayed an extra week and I was with a friend and I was a jewelry designer back those days. 
and I wanted some antiquities. I found out some people were collecting, had antiquities because they lived right outside the mountain. Actually, their houses were perched on the edge of the mountain. They backed into the mountain. And so they had these, a lot of them were digging in their back wall. <laughs> their back wall was just the mountain. So they'd, they'd be digging at night. And then in the daytime, they had this beautiful carpet hanging over it. I asked my friend if he knew somebody that might have some of these, you know, little beads. I was looking for little antique beads. And I found some and I, I needed some money, more ATM. So I had to go back the second day. Now in Egypt, when you purchase something, especially if you're a friend of a friend, it's a social, you know, event. You have a cup of coffee, you have a Coca-Cola water, you sit and visit, you talk about your grandmother, you talk about every, their children, they want to show you all the pictures. It's a real drama, you know? So I go back and they, they wanted to really treat me well. They brought out a joint and I don't smoke. I, I don't... heard about that Egyptian sense of media. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't smoke and I'm not an expert in any stretch of the way for pot or anything. So I, I said, no, thank you. Well, Muhammad <laughs> erupted in rage because not only did I insult him because it's the best, it's the best. It's somebody who went on and on and on. And I'm the only lady there and the only American. And I'm like, oh boy, you know, maybe I should reconsider. I have tried it a few times. Nothing happened for me. You know, I never got high. So I'll just, okay, I'll just keep the peace here. I'm a, I'm a born Canadian, remember? I didn't want to make any drama. So I, I, they brought the joint around twice and I did, you know, make it look like I did. And then it was done. Everybody jumped up and ready to go. And I couldn't leave. I couldn't get out of the chair. It was like my arms and legs, I was paralyzed. And next thing you know, I felt myself standing behind my body and I could see everybody's movie, like their life review on movie screen, like a TV, like I was at Circuit City, seeing these 10, 10 life roles. And it was really freaky. And, and I, I said, you know, I put my hand out in front of me thinking, I just need water. I need to stay in my body. I need to stay in my body. And I remember everything was in slow motion. My friend Juju walked up to me and he must have poured some water in my hands. And as I got it closer to my face, I said, I remember the last thought. It was like, oh shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> I've got to ask the, the obvious question here is, right? How many hits of that thing did you take? How strong was that? Oh, I do. And, and, you know, when I came back, I have to say this. I was really concerned. I had a heart condition. I had been detoxing about two weeks before I came to Egypt and I had done a 30-day detox. So there was a high likelihood, my doctor told me after they did a whole battery of tests, everything was fine. And he said, your amino acids are a bit low. And he said, you could have been dehydrated. And the fact that I was super, super, super sensitive after having a spiritual pilgrimage for two weeks and detoxed, whatever that was, sent me into orbit, you know? literally it kicked me out of my body so no, it was it was pretty intense and i can't i can't even to this day it was so traumatic that i can't i don't even want to be around people that are smoking pot and, and that sounds like a really you know minor thing but not for me i don't i i think i'm going to leave the planet if i do so your near-death experience was really an astral travel experience right here here's the thing you could say that i collapsed they pounded my chest with all their might. Oh, okay. Um, so you did actually flatline. He, he told me like, oh, maybe 10 minutes later when I did come back that I was, my breathing stopped and my heart stopped. And so what happened was my friend put his arm, put, grabbed me under the arms, dragged me out and pushed me into a truck. I was in the cab of a truck and I don't remember any of this. I had been propped up. My head was out the window. I, I laughingly say they were giving me oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> and the Egyptian CPR was pounding my chest. But I started coming back and I, I started, I felt like a shooting star or a comet. And I remember shooting through the star system. And I remember seeing the globe 
way, way, or a ball, a blue ball, and I was heading towards it. And it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's a big place. Where am I? How, how am I going to find my body? And then it came to me, I heard these voices that in a language I couldn't understand. And I'm like, I don't know that language. And the next thought was, oh, Egypt, that's where I left myself. And it was kind of a comical little dialogue that I remember in my head, kind of, or my, this voice. And so then trying to get into my body felt like trying to put on a wet, wet suit. Have you ever put on wet clothes or, so I struggled and struggled and struggled. It was thick. It was dense. It was icky. And then I couldn't open my eyes. I remember the light being so incredibly bright. It was right about noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. And when I finally was able to sort of peek a glimpse and where am I, I remember saying to my friend and feeling utter bliss and utter peace and joy. And I remember just sort of reaching out and touching his arm. And then he's just, what? Yeah, she's alive. <laughs> of course, they're speaking in Arabic. They were so excited. They didn't, and in a negative way, they, they, they thought I died. And that would have been a catastrophe for all of them. Because a year before that, there was a massacre, not a mile down the road at Queen Hatshepsut Temple. I think 31 Europeans were killed by, they called it a crazy guy came from the mountains. I think that was early ISIS. <laughs> but they, you know, so if there was a law in the government, if anything happened to a U.S. citizen, they would have all been thrown to jail, lost everything. Oh, so wow. they were really on edge, you know, and so... So when I touched him and, and then I said, where are you taking me? Because I just felt like my gut was going to explode. That's all I could, that's, that was the only physical feeling I had was my gut. Right. Did you drink the water? I always drink bottled water. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And when we're there, we have a rule. We don't eat anything that's not been cooked or peeled. That's sort of our rule to stay safe. And I say our rule, I've been 12 times now and I take groups. Wow. Like, and and, and near-death experience is not on the itinerary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm out then. <laughs> it's extra for that. <laughs> okay. In fact, a plug for it, 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 we've got one planned for this October, um, mm. October 30th, 31st. Yeah, I saw that on your bio. We'll talk about that a little okay. bit later. I'm sure, because it sounds super interesting. So then, so then you came back, and were your gifts all of a sudden like a light switch and all of a sudden spirits were talking to you or was it more of a gradual reveal of of these tools well after i got out of the bathroom and my friend was sitting next to me and just tears were streaming down his face he said you don't understand he said you died and like i was in total bliss i felt like nothing happened i didn't feel like i died you know, I was cool, except I had to go to the bathroom real bad. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to go to the bathroom really bad when I die. Come back. <laughs> so I had to, I couldn't walk. And so I rested in their bedroom for quite some time. No bathroom then. Well, I, they sort of escorted me out. I couldn't, I couldn't walk. My, le my legs weren't working. I was really, really weak in terms of, you know, physical strength. I don't think, honestly, I was yet back in my body completely. And I laid there and rested for quite a while, water, yogurt, orange that they brought me. But I started to see an entity in the armoire in the wood grain. Every time I looked in the wood grain, I would see Sekhmet. She's the goddess, the, he the, go the healer's healer. She's the goddess known as the patron saint for all the doctors and the healers. And so I would, I, I thought I was losing my mind, of course. And then I, there was a window and the gentle breeze from the Nile was fluttering the, the curtains. And I kept looking out the window going, that's real. That's not. She and the wood grain is not real. We keep looking at the lush green Nile Valley because that's real. And so I struggled. I'm like, which I'm going to look at this world, not this world. And so it went back and forth like that. And so I tried to ignore that. When I got to the airport that day, like four hours later, one of the guides that was with me, the tour guides, I asked her, who's this lion goddess, you know, in the female body? She goes, oh, that's Sekhmet. Sekhmet's with me today, every day, all the time. And she's an incredibly powerful 
healing entity. And quite honestly, I got to tell you, you know, speaking of skeptics, I was raised Catholic. And so (laughs) I, I, I didn't really resonate with Egyptology. And I thought, okay, it's, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting myth or, or whatever you want to call it. And it wasn't until that, that Egypt came alive for me. Mm, That's super interesting to reveal something of myself. Egypt has always called to me. I don't know what it is, but Ankhs really speak to me uh, the pyramids. I mean, it's, it's one of those places where either I have been there before somewhere in my many lifetimes ago. Or I'm called to go there at some point. I'll tell you the first time I was there, there was something about it that I felt home. And I hear that from a lot of the people that come with us. Wow. I know I've been here before. And so, yeah, reconnecting with that, coming home. And it was fascinating how many Egyptians would say, welcome home, madam. Welcome home, my sister. Very touching. They say it's the cradle of mankind, right? Of life. So that's, uh, that could be a lot to that. We are all going home when we go back to Egypt, I guess. Okay. So then I want to, to now transition to what happened afterwards. So you are uh, an incredibly gifted clairvoyant. You are a spirit medium. And in fact, as we're having our technical snafus, some, something was trying to come through something yeah. and it was, it was causing all kinds of electrical challenges. So you actually have gotten a hold of all of your spiritual gifts and now are turning it around to help others to come to terms with their own spiritual awakening. You mentioned earlier on in the interview that your own spiritual awakening was very difficult as we've talked to many people before who have had very difficult spiritual awakenings. So now you are helping people with their own journeys, with their own travels. You have a program and a mastery training called Reveal, which is a chakra healing program. You also are about to release a new book called The Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening. And like you mentioned, you're taking applications for an upcoming journey to Egypt. So what is the first step when someone feels like there's something happening to me, I need to get someone to help me What's the first step? I mean, other than obviously reach out to you, what should someone know? Well, like you, I think your journey is a good example. You started exploring. You became curious, right? And you, and you're starting to poke and prod and, and inquire. For me, when people come to me, usually there's some form of trauma or loss or illness that we need to resolve first. That's sort of the catapult or the catalyst. And so the very first thing that happens is we have to learn how to clear that, you know, and, and being present, whether it's something we, whether we want to manifest a new relationship or a career, or we want to know more about our gifts, it's all kind of part and parcel of the same thing. Because when I take people on the journey of the revealing program, where we start clearing our chakras. It's like I said earlier, it's like we're just clearing the virus. We're just clearing the accumulation of belief systems, outmoded programming, systemic, uh, you know, cult collective thoughts. Like Egypt is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've lived with that thought for many, many years. Absolutely. And, and you see, that may keep you away from e- exploring and and fulfilling a lifelong spiritual quest. Yeah. So I, it's it, no surprise, no mystery. Everybody knows it's been revealed that one of the things that keeps me back, you know, with a lot of things is fear. I've always wanted to astral project, but I'm deathly afraid of the critters that live in the ether. So I don't, it doesn't let me do it. Right? So there's a lot of validity to that, but how can someone overcome that fear? Okay. So first of all, you want to do extreme sport and psychic <laughs> yes yes i do have. yes i do you're, you're an extremist okay of a different form <laughs> well you know we we need to take it in ways like if you're going to build something first of all you need to get the right tools right you need a map or a plan or a you know a, a starting point and that is learning how to ground make the body feel safe When we start exploring a new language or exploring, let's say, a new art form, 
you're not going to go out and be a Picasso. Well, maybe you could be a Picasso, but maybe it's not a Rembrandt, for instance, immediately. You've got to develop a skill set and a level of comfort of working with your new tools and developing your style. And, and you know, it's a funny thing because it's you're talking and, and exploring it with your intellect. And I take people into the experience. So in a way, we got to crawl before we can walk or run. So all of these topics are super psychic, sexy, psychic stuff, I'll call it, you know? It's super adventurous and unknown. And you know what? I remember as a little kid playing with the Ouija board and then other people telling me, you know, you're playing with fire. Well, I didn't realize I could be opening up a portal for demons and entities to come in. Well, fear, it not necessarily only blocks you from having those experiences, but it too is a magnet and drawing things to you. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're first kind of starting out and, and having that spiritual awakening, we've spoken with quite a few people and they've told us that, you know, they felt like they were going crazy. I mean, how do you know that that's not what it is? Like, how do you know that, that it's a spiritual awakening? What, what helped you to understand? I had, that? I had no one there, but my intuition. And so it was a longer journey than it needed to be. Okay. Or it was perfect for me. I'm not going to say, but now there's so many teachers and mentors. I would say find someone or a modality that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. Because like in my, before I even take anybody into my reveal program, we work one-on-one -on -one with four sessions and I will reveal to you secrets that you've never told anybody. Oh, wow. And so when I can develop that rapport with you and build a trust level, mm -hmm. I would say to my students and future clients is that if when we hit the skids or we hit some scary stuff that you don't want to let go of, you being able to trust me or hang on to what the anchor that I provide for you will be what gets you through that tough zone. And so I wish I had someone like that. I think my mm -hmm. process took so much longer because there was no one there to hold my rails as I walk through the passageway. Mm. I can't do it for you, but I can give you the tools and hold a space for you to safely navigate it. And I say safely and emphasize it because there are a lot of pitfalls. And when we're dealing with the unseen world, let's just say I have done um, exorcisms or mm -hmm. removed entities and removed ET, what do you call it? Implants. There's been a lot of different things that I've explored and seen because I can see it. Okay. I'm not afraid of it when I have the right tools and the right system to approach it. Right. Mm -hmm. I just zoom it out <laughs> and make it like a little cereal monster. And all of a sudden it's no big deal. <laughs> uh, you just, you just took that pin out of that grenade and dropped it and walked away. I was like, no, 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 it wasn't me. Wait, you just dropped so much in that one little sentence. ET implant. Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. Well, just one of the things that made me go, huh? Right. Exorcism. So you're saying the demons are real. You're saying that there are extraterrestrials that are, have been among us and are actually abducting people. I mean, it's really hard for me to date. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh my uh, God. Like, I, I'm sorry. I'm channeling. I'd like to give you an example. Yes. Uh, okay, using my clairvoyance, just looking, having this, that what I call the lighthouse in the center of my head, right? I had a client call me from Connecticut years ago, and she also was a psychic, but she worked with cards and, and things like that. So she calls me up and she goes, Amira, I'd like you to take a look at my son. We've got some problems with him. He's about nine years old. And all of a sudden, this kid from going outside and playing with his friends and being really gregarious, he became very depressed and very aggressive. And the school approached her and said, you know, we want to put your kid on Ritalin. And he's got ADHD, he can't settle down, and he's just off the rails. And she was like really adamant to putting him on these meds. And so that's why she called me. So when I looked at him, and, and honest to God, I don't go looking for the aliens. They just show up. <laughs> and 
And so I was looking at this and I'm like, okay, this is going to sound really bizarre, Trisha. But what I see is a spaceship plugged into the center of your kid's head. And they are using his brain like a periscope, peeking in and seeing the world through his eyes. I said, look, I, I, I don't know other than what I'm seeing. I'm telling you what I'm seeing, but I knew I could back it out. And it was like, I erased them and their connection to him. And I, I remember it vaguely because I go into a modified trance when I'm doing this work, but I told the story so many times that it comes back. So I remember tracing the line where it went to the ship. And then I, you know, communicated with them and just sort of did my signaling and erasing it and hit their connection to him, like unplugging it. Like mm -hmm. if I'm going into a computer system, I'd be fine. Oh, there's a virus. Wipe it out. Reboot. Okay, we're good, right? No more virus. Well, she went to pick up her son and well, she told me, she goes, Amira, what, what's really weird is lately all of his drawings that he brought home and they're all in the fridge are ETs and spaceships wow and so that was fine she went to get him and she brought him home and she told him oh honey today i spoke spoke to amira and she moved et from your head and he goes oh mom that was my friend uh, he was completely aware of okay. their communication with him and, and unknowingly or whether there was like, I could call it an energetic portal or a doorway that was open. His curiosity was everything. They just plugged in. Not good or bad, right or wrong. And they can do that because everything's energy. But the beautiful thing is after we cleared it, he went back to being his old self. No drugs, back to playing in the yard, no depression, none of it. Oh, gosh. So I will say to you, <laughs> as a skeptic myself, when I, 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 I'm skeptical of even what I see, but I've been doing this for 22 years now. And I learned more than anything. I don't know jack shit when it comes to what's out there mm. and the possibilities. So I try and just stretch and allow and be neutral. Mm -hmm. And, and then when the client comes back and tells me and gives me the val validation or the verification that this was correct. Like, I don't need to go alien or ET chasing. I healed mm -hmm. a problem for him here and now. Mm. So my purpose is not to chase, you know, ETs. We are simpatico in that sense. Mm -hmm. I'm a skeptic in as much that I need it explained in a way that my limited brain can understand. I do know in the course we've been doing the show now for a year and i do know that if there's one thing that i've learned during the show is that we don't know shit about <laughs> anything right? uh, and and the more we do the show the more it opens up my views and it opens up my minds about the fact that because i don't know shit it doesn't mean that it's not real i just need to compartmentalize it okay so if there are ets out there in the world where how why i mean all that kind of stuff those are the questions that immediately come to mind not th not that no i don't believe ets aren't real i believe that whatever someone says to me is real there's no reason for me not to believe it right it may not resonate with me but i do believe it's real and i just have to figure out how does that make sense to me well i would say to you if you were my client stop trying to figure it out I can't. That's I've me. That's been just telling him that forever. Okay, so sometimes, like, okay, we're all extremely well trained with our linear logical mind, mm -hmm. but to be able to connect with our heart, it's not through your head. Yes, I agree, and I I hear what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying, and I do know that I've got to be okay with the fact that. I'm not going to have all the answers. There's just no no possible way to have the answers because we live in the world of quantum mechanics where every answer is the right answer and every answer is the wrong answer. I, I'm very well aware of that. However, it's a very uncomfortable place for me to live in. So I try to make sense of things, which is my way of making my world stay grounded. Because I do want to believe in all this stuff. I really do. I just need to know that I'm not just going for a ride. 
See, but I would think trying to find all the answers and figuring it out, that's just going to give you so much anxiety. Well, it takes a lot of your energetic power Hmm. because just imagine what you could be creating if that was flipped. Well, we're creating this this show. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. That's That's true. But I mean, we, we limit our experiences based on our perspective. Mm-hmm. And you said that you, by keeping your yourself grounded, you keep things. And the perception I got was, you keep yourself safe in a safe zone, feeling threatened by anything that doesn't make sense. And if you're always grounded, you're never going to be able to fly. <sighs> God, the two of you are ganging up on me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you're both correct. Yes, you are both correct. Yes, I read the book Communion when I was in college. Didn't sleep for two weeks after I read the book. So the thought of having ETs be real is not a fun thought for me because I read the book and it was very uncomfortable. for me. So it, that's just an example. So sure, I try to paint my little, you know, uh, Les Nessman in WKRP in Cincinnati, where he has a tape that that signifies where his office starts and stops. Even though there's no no physical walls, the tape, he would say, no, you, you know, you, you can't cross this line because now you're in my office without having come to the door. That's kind of how my mind is trying to piece it all together. I've got this tape on the floor and you can't come here unless you come in through this particular door, which helps me to put it in perspective. Well, it's called control issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you and, and, and here's and, and you know we can laugh at it because we've all got that in some mm-hmm. way shape or form but the more look i i have those too but the journey has taken me there are a lot of twists and turns blown my mind gazillions of times and i think you know i don't like i was thinking well how do i need to prove it to you no i don't need to prove it to you i've had you know, computer analysts and computer programmers and engineers. And I work with a lot of guys because in many ways, the system that I work with makes sense to them. Mm. The part of you losing control or not being able to manage or stop something around you is a a, a fear of not having control or resisting change. But once we get into that flow, you start to access more power and you get turbocharged you know so I, I i guess it's a question of what do you want to create because i'm not here to convince anybody i'm here to help people create what they want so if we can get out of our own way and start thinking like okay well i've got these supernatural gifts that want to come in why 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 would i not want to accelerate those Usually there's a trauma, maybe a past life like in Egypt, or perhaps an abduction that you can't really recall that is blocking some of your... <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. He doesn't want any. <laughs> no, I don't. Ignorance is bad. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry for going down that E.T. rabbit hole. But... No, it's, it's, it's been great. It's, it's, it's not something that we talk about often, but mm-hmm. uh, it's certainly something that we started talking into even before we start recording. We never know where the universe is going to take the conversation. That's part of the fun of doing this show. We have a lot <laughs> to talk about with you, but we're running out of time. But I really, I want to make sure that we focus on your program, like how you help people with their ascension. I know that you, we talked about reveal a little bit, but what what is that exactly? How does that work? Well, everybody is unique. Everybody has their own path and their own journey and their discovery. Basically, my job is to help you clear what you are not. And I don't know the full picture of who and everything that you are. How can I know? All I know is what you think you are and what you're presenting to the world probably isn't. So I just help people, you know, decompress. And, you know, it's like a reconstruction project. And so we just start dismantling, you know, safely. So that you you don't feel like you're going to instantaneously combust. It's not like a you know drive through process. It <laughs> is a gentle journey, and all of a sudden it's like you know when you go outside and you look for that rose to blossom, and it just never you know you go out day after day and it's still not blossoming, but then you forget about it and you're like oh and then you walk by oh look at that the rose opened. That's kind of a metaphor or analogy of how this process happens. We start cleaning windows and clearing out old furniture and clearing out the cupboards 
And next thing you know, you start feeling fresher and lighter and, hey, I feel good in my place. And that's what happens. And then you start manifesting more and you start feeling different, lighter and brighter. And so it's not for me to tell you what gifts and abilities you have. It's between you and the creator. They will resurrect. And I assume that everyone is different. So you couldn't say, oh, it's a six-week process or it's a 12-week process. It's however long it takes you to go through it. That's how long it takes you. Well, my clairvoyant, the, the chakra process is 10 weeks. My intuitive mastery is 12 weeks. I was working with a man in Saudi Arabia and he came to me in Dubai. He had found me and, and he wanted to develop his clairvoyance. He was already a healer and doing the work. And so when he came and he went through the program, after the program, a, a week or two after, I said, so I feel like you're not happy. You feel like I didn't deliver or you wanted something more. And he goes, yes, that's true. It was, it was so <laughs> sweet. And, and I said, you know what? You're not done yet. You're going to be processing for another 10 weeks or more. So I think it was about six or eight weeks after, again, like not looking at that rose, asking it to blossom. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden he contacted me and said, you're not going to believe this. I can see inside my, my client's bodies. I can see their organs. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm laughing about it to this day because I don't see like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But his abilities were like, whoa. I mean, he's seeing in high definition, you know, interdimensionally amazing. Wow. And he's loving it. I guess the clients love it too. <laughs> uh, he's, he, we've, he, yet another rabbit hole that you just dropped in our lap. And, <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Um, well, let's talk real quickly about your trip to Egypt, because that sounds super interesting to me. And I know that you're now, you're, you're taking applications for people to join you on this sacred journey, I guess, right? We're taking deposits anytime soon because we are waiting for the final dates, okay? There's been a lot of changes with air flights and things like that. So we're getting everything finalized in terms of dates, and we'll have that shortly. So anybody that's interested, just at least send me on my website. You can fill in the application, then we can get back to you with the details. But, you know, for the, I believe it's on November 8th, is a full moon eclipse. And we're going to be in the king's chamber in a private ceremony on that day oh my god Just our group in a meditation and i can tell you i, I don't know i've had so many mind-blowing experiences in the great pyramids you know well when you go to egypt <laughs> you don't see things the same after well i've always been drawn to it egypt calls you it's not one of those things that oh you think it's on your you know bucket list no it's calling you yeah yeah and I just want to say, if anybody wants to connect with me and have a small reading, every Wednesday I'm having a virtual small group. And so you can access that on my website. So you can touch base with me and feel if, you know, poke, poke the bear, so to speak, and see <laughs> out the water. <laughs> well, we're going to go ahead and add links to your website and your socials and all that kind of stuff on our show notes. So if you are interested in going to Egypt with Amira or reaching out to her about a reading or a healing or, or just to say hello, you know, uh -huh. you can just go to skepticmetaphysician.com, go to her episode and right there, you will have a direct link. So you can just go directly there. You don't have to keep searching or Google or whatever. It's right there for you, for your convenience. So much more for us to talk about. I, I feel, wait, I'm, I'm feeling like you're going to be on the show again in the future. <laughs> I just feel it. <laughs> okay. You're scrying one-on-one, right? Yes. yes. Sign up for that class. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. I would love to share with, to pe with people down in the next episode, how I got the princess in Dubai pregnant. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh, wait, wait, that's wait, wait. a cliffhanger. This is a family show, though. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's not a traditional manner, so let's just leave it there. Wow. wow. Yeah, not fair. Not fair. Uh... <laughs>
All right. Well, for those of you who just listened to that, heard that, and you are just as mad as us, I need you to write into the show so that when we compile all the emails, angry people saying no fair to Amira, it will force her to come back and tell us the story of the princess who got pregnant. So, Amira, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show with us today. It was my true pleasure with all my heart and soul. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, and I'm dying to hear more. So definitely, please come back. Yes. Don't die to hear more, okay? <laughs> well. <laughs> She's living to hear more. Living to hear living more. Living to hear more. <laughs> I'm starting to choose my words a little more carefully. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Very true. <laughs> okay. Before we leave you, I did want to share with you a new review that came in through our website. Her name is Bertha Moreno. She is from the United States. She gave us five-star rating, Karen. Ooh. Another five-star rating. So thank you, Bertha, for doing the five-star waiting for us. She says that she's sending big love and immense gratitude. She says the skeptic metaphysicians has been my consistent source of strength, faith, trust, surrender, belief, growth, inspiration, determination, and the seeds of growth in my consciousness throughout my Phoenix process. Those are big, big words. That is amazing. It is, it is absolutely amazing. So Bertha, thanks so much for being a listener and we are so grateful that you reached out and told us how you feel about the show. And we're glad that it's helping you in some way because we are literally just here to help everyone get these messages. Now, we'd love to hear from you too. So visit us at skepticminophysician.com. Let us know when you're listening to us from. We'd love to put a pin in the map for wherever you're listening from. And of course, we'd love it if you left us a voicemail or an email or a review while you're there. We do appreciate every single one of them, and we're always looking for ways to improve the show. And reviews, ratings, emails, voicemails are many ways that we can evolve and grow by learning what you like and what you don't. And we want to thank you for coming along on this journey of discovery with us. Don't forget, you can continue our conversation with us on Facebook and Instagram at skepticmetaphysician.com. And if you know someone that would benefit from hearing the messages we've shared on the show or any of our others, I hope you will consider sharing us with that person to help grow the show and may help just someone else come to terms with the fact that we are so much more than just this three-dimensional body that we inhabit. Karen, I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I have. Oh, absolutely. Because that is all we got for now. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see you all on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysicians. Until then, take care. Take care.